So welcome everyone. So today uh, we're coming to you from Hive MQ headquarters in Landshut, Germany. And today I've got a special guest, Frederick Debian, who's the program manager of Eclipse Foundation. Uh, he's visited us here, so we're going to be talking about uh, Spark Plug. And uh, I'll let Frederick introduce yourself. Frederick, welcome. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me, Kudzai. It's a real pleasure to be here. And the town here is fantastic. You should visit. Now, uh, I'm the program manager and evangelist at Eclipse Foundation for everything about IoT and edge computing. And so, of course, uh, HiveNQ is a member in our Eclipse IoT working group, in our Sparklog working group, so we have plenty to talk about today together. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. What I want us to do is to kind of like talk about Sparklock like at a high level mm -hmm. and maybe a good place to start here is to kind of like give us a definition of Sparklock in like layman terms. Yes. So essentially, when you think about, generally speaking, industrial automation, IoT types of use cases, there are plenty of solutions, uh, you know, and, and protocols in the market. But one that emerged uh, in, the, in the last few years, right, it's been around for a while, but now it's got real momentum, is MQTT, right? And now everyone is doing MQTT, and that's great. And, and the fantastic thing about MQTT is that you can publish anything anywhere. The bad thing about MQTT is that you can publish anything anywhere. So out of the box, MQTT devices and software components, they don't interoperate. So the goal of Sparkplug is to fix this lack of interoperability in MQTT. That's the value that it delivers to its users. Awesome. So now, how does uh, Sparkplug uh, support digital transformation initiatives? So essentially, the way Sparkplug works is that it defines three things in order to, su to support the digital transformation. The first one is a set of standard payloads. Okay, so that you know in advance what kind of data you're getting. The second one is, of course, what we call the topic namespace. In other words, you define a hierarchy, like a folder hierarchy on a hard drive, for example, which is predictable and structured, so you know in advance where the information will be. And this namespace provides, as well, a context about the data that you are about to publish. And the third one is stateful session management so that you know at every given time if the devices are online or not. So from a digital transformation perspective, Sparklog is really transformative because out of the box, devices and software components will work together. So you don't have to tweak the payloads. You don't have to, to, to parse or to write additional code in order to get the data out of the messages. And you get access to a set of products that have been certified using, you know, the Sparklog official official compatibility kit. Okay, yeah. so on our website we have a list of products that pass the compatibility kit, and the Hive MQ broker, of course, is one of them. And 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 really, you can pick from them products that you know in advance will work together, no questions asked. And 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 that's a big difference because in most typical industrial automation projects, okay, you do proof of concepts and you pick the components that fulfill the requirements, but after that you have a lengthy phase of integration and, and changes and tweaks to, to really adapt this to your own organizational environment. You don't have to do that with Sparkplug because out of the box everything works together. So really Sparkplug is an accelerator for digital transformation from that perspective because you spend more time on solving the actual problem and less time on, you know, uh, whipping the infrastructure into shape. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, one of the uh, reasons really why a lot of companies are looking to digitally transform is really kind of like to gain a competitive advantage. So uh, at a business level, perhaps, what competitive advantages would you say companies that adopt Sparkplug are afforded? So one uh, is certainly that you free up resources to innovate, right? By simplifying the problem of infrastructure, and picking from a stable of products that have been certified to work with the Sparkplug specification, then you spend more time to build new products or 
deliver services to your customers. And that's certainly one big dimension out of it. The other, of course, is that by leveraging Sparkplug, you join a whole ecosystem which is completely open. In the sense that if you, if you think about OPC UA, OPC is great technology, okay? But it's developed behind closed doors. You have to be a member of the OPC Foundation to get access to the specs. And of course, uh, if you want to submit new ideas for new versions, well, you have to be a member of the club as well. So that's really uh, the old approach, let's say, to uh, industrial automation where, you know, you have to be a member of the club and things happen behind closed doors. In the case of Sparklog, you know, we just published uh, Sparklog version 3. We started the work on Sparklog version 4 and everything is happening in public. So the, the, the new changes to the spec will appear at some point on GitHub. Uh, if you have ideas for Sparkplug, you can submit them, open an issue on GitHub, and discuss directly with the people working on the spec or on its open source implementation, uh, which is the Eclipse Taboo project. And, you know, you, you don't need to be a member of Eclipse or anything like that. You just come with your ideas. And, of course, maybe, you know, the team will decide to take your idea or not, there's no guarantee, but there is this open conversation. And this is a game changer because what we're trying to build here is a successful ecosystem. And a successful ecosystem is always an open one. Okay, so Sparkplug is a relatively uh, a new specification. So a lot of um, uh, industrial uh, installations or implementations currently have some older protocols, right? So maybe one of the questions that um, companies could be asking is, if we were to move to, um, uh, to, to, to implementing Sparkplug or using uh, um, equipment that is Sparkplug compliant, what would be the, uh, the cost implications of making that shift? Well, of course, any change has a cost. Nothing is really free in life. So I won't pretend that Sparkplug magically solves every problem for free. But it is less expensive than you would imagine to transition to Sparkplug. First, Sparkplug is not there to supplement or completely replace anything that you currently have and that works, right? It can work with that. And that's one of its uh, strengths, especially when you think, let's say, about OPC UA, which is fairly common in organizations nowadays. Now, if we dig deeper a bit on this topic of OPC UA, for example, uh, most deployments don't have necessarily OPC UA implemented at the level of the device, a robot or even microcontrollers in a smart building or things like that. You don't have OPC UA there. You will have somewhere in the architecture a kind of protocol converter that will take a mud bus, scan bus, uh, backnet, whatever you have, and translate that to OPC at some level, maybe in a gateway, maybe in a standalone converter. Um, so essentially, Switching to Sparkplug means that you can replace that OPC UA-specific converters with one which is Sparkplug compatible. So the cost is uh, less because of that. And, and, and then going forward, what will happen is that more and more smaller, you know, uh, Sparkplug compared to OPC is, is lighter weight. Uh, because uh, an MQTT broker is much leaner than a typical OPC UA server. So which means you can even run Sparkplug on microcontrollers at the very edge of the network. And so progressively, your current infrastructure will stay as is, but connect to Sparkplug enabled gateways, let's say, or edge nodes. And on the other end, um, you will deploy newer things that will speak Sparkplug natively. So progressively your legacy uh, applications and deployments will get surrounded by this Sparkplug goodness. And when you are ready, then you will be able to migrate the last pieces to Sparkplug eventually when it makes sense for your organization. And this is the goal of Sparkplug, not only to be interoperable uh, at the MQTT level, you know, but really to be able to work with whatever you have right now. And our members, like AlvenQ, are working on solutions that integrate. I mean, you have a number of plugins uh, for your broker, for example, that speak various things, and some of those are more legacy things, so to speak. Uh, so our 
other members do the same. And so overall, our ecosystem is able really to make sure that if you enable digital transformation with Sparkplug, you can do it at a reasonable cost without having to rebuild everything from scratch. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, would I be correct to say that the benefits of uh, implementing Sparkplug they, they far outweigh the cost of really laying that uh, foundation. Absolutely. And Sparklog is an enabler for new things, right? Things that will enable you to compete more and uh, things that will enable you to really focus on your customers and partners rather than solving IT problems because no one, there's no value in that to just, yes. you know, getting the things working. And, and we've got uh, a number of examples already that are uh, documented uh, in, in white papers and deliverables from our members. But uh, a bit later in our conversation, I have a specific one that I can yeah. discuss uh, to go over this. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe let's, let's kind of like delve okay, into that there. because right. one of the big questions that we get is like to say, do you have an example of a company that saw benefits from implementing Sparkla? So maybe if we could address that question, that would be great. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so this is uh, the example of uh, Waterford Township, which is a municipal government, uh, I think, in the state of Michigan in, in the U.S. And so this is a small local government with about a population of uh, 72,000 people over a fairly large territory. This is North America, right? Yeah. So plenty of space to expand. And they have this water, uh, you know, drinking water distribution system uh, on, on their territory. So a number of pumping stations and all. And uh, I don't have the, the metrics by heart, but let's say it's, you know, a fairly extensive networks of uh, water pipes and, and pumping stations over a fairly large territory, of course. And uh, in their case, they had a legacy solution uh, that wasn't fulfilling the bill anymore. You know, every time that something was happening on their network, uh, you know, of equipment in the field, they were getting notifications after three or four minutes. Now, if you have a water leak, you know, a serious one at a pumping station, Knowing it four minutes late is already, you know, thousands of uh, liters of water, drinking water that have been wasted and could damage the equipment at the pumping station on the top of that. So you need to be more um, proactively warned of those things and, and to learn them in early real time if you want to be able to effectively manage the infrastructure. So they decided to replace this legacy system that they were having with one based on Sparkplug, uh, including uh, Groove devices from Opto22, one of our members, and then a software solution from uh, inductive automation that's called Ignition that supports Sparkplug and all of that. And so that's a comprehensive full Sparkplug solution that they deployed. And they spoke about it in a, in a prior uh, Eclipse webinar from, from a few years back. And uh, we presented this regularly in presentations as well. And so the, the benefits that they got out of this implementation are really uh, incredible. Uh, now they have sub-second latency across their entire system. So in less than a second, they will know when something happens somewhere. And Sparkplug, by the way, is reporting by exception. So this means if a value doesn't change or if a value is the normal threshold, you don't get bombarded with useless messages. You will get an updated value if it changes. And really, this means the certain benefit uh, Sparkplug decreases bandwidth usage a lot. And in their case, they were relying on uh, LTE or some other cellular type of connectivity in the field. So, of course, telcos are happy to for yeah. you to consume lots of bandwidth because they can invoice you, but you don't want to do that. So they were able, because of the, uh, the fact that Sparkplug is lightweight, uh, Sparkplug uh, sends less data over the wire. So they were able to significantly decrease their bandwidth consumption, which is good uh, from their perspective. Of course, now, uh, when a system action is needed, when there are alarms or notifications, they don't miss them anymore because everything is near real time. Of course, given the large territory at work there, you, you wouldn't be able to, to get actual real time uh, you know, from, from every point. And then this means that ultimately the, the system is really uh, f better in terms of fault tolerance and disaster recovery because once again, they were able to deploy 
in redundant nodes in, in key places. And of course, uh, the central uh, broker in the system is, uh, you know, uh, as fed over capabilities and fault tolerance and things like that. So overall, you know, it's been really a huge success for them because yes, they had to invest some money, but now instead of having, you know, a 28th century system, to manage their infrastructure, they have a 21st century one, and they can build on the top of that to now bring additional values to their constituents as well. One of the other big questions around Sparkplug is um, how does uh, Sparkplug uh, help uh, uh, organizations sort of like um, comply with security regulations, or what's, how, how, how does security work with Sparkplug? Let's put it that way. Yes. So there, uh, certainly, uh, Sparklog follows a bit the same philosophy as MQTT. When you read the MQTT spec, there is a section on security, but it's non-normative in the sense that uh, they document best practices, but it's really up to you to decide what makes sense for your use case. The one thing that's really well supported in MQTT, and that's the most fundamental thing for data integrity, is, of course, uh, the TLS encryption, so the same that you use to connect to your bank in your browser. So, of course, you have that in base MQTT, and you have that when you use Sparkplug, because Sparkplug uses MQTT as the, the, the transport protocol underneath. Um, so... We have also in the Sparklog spec a section on security, and it is intentionally lightweight because the, the, the people that wrote the spec, so people with, you know, collectively decades of experience in industrial automation, felt that it was best to delegate things like that to the underlying MQTT broker. So the, apart from, of course, enabling TLS on whatever broker you will be using, the key thing there is to have a look at the security feature set of the brokers that are available to you. And there, uh, you know, IvanQ is certainly a, a very, very good choice. And they are, of course, open source options that offer, uh, for example, in the case of uh, Eclipse Mosquito, a lightweight broker available in nearly every MQTT, uh, not MQTT, but every Linux distribution. Um, it's got uh, the principle of access control, control lists and ACLs that you can leverage in order to segregate topics that are security sensitive over some that needs maybe less security. So really, if you are a business person, the key thing there is to give your IoT architects the mandate to evaluate broker options that make sense for you. But from a commercial perspective, if you need commercial support, IBMQ is certainly a very good option. <laughs> oh yeah. Absolutely. One of the key things really that uh, a business um, executives really look at as far as um, uh, adoption of a technology is concerned is how that impact could be tied to um, uh, improving like things like operational efficiency or productivity, things that they could actually uh, look at and see this this is actually improving. Uh, can, you, can, can you talk to us about how Sparklag can actually impact uh, efficiency and productivity in industrial operations. Yes, absolutely. So, as we have seen with uh, Waterford Township, they were able to have a, a type of system where they were doing polling and response in order to know if devices are online. And then after that, you know, they, 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 they were getting those updates in three or four minutes for the infrastructure in the field. So, switching to Sparkplug in this case meant that because of the very low latency of the new infrastructure, they were getting near real-time data and were able to make better informed options when the situation required it. So essentially, when you think about Sparkplug, um, the, 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 the key thing to remember there is that by having a performant MQTT broker in the middle, you know, and some of them are able to literally process millions of messages a second. Okay. Uh, this is really incredible. So you have essentially basic infrastructure that then enables near real time decision making. And of course, Sparklog is just a piece of the whole solution there in the sense that maybe you will need 
uh, big data types of mechanisms in order to keep an up up to date data lake for AI and things like that, right? Uh, in order to uh, make predictions or predictive maintenance and things like that. And on the other end, um, you know, you, you will probably have an analytics dashboard that will keep an eye on real time in ma on metrics uh, that are key to operations and that kind of stuff. But Spotplug is this low latency, low bandwidth enabler for all of those things. So by itself, you know, just because you have Spotplug, you won't, let's say, save $10 million or 10 million euros. But without Spotplug, you wouldn't be to save those because you wouldn't get the data in time to make better decisions. And that's where it fits overall in the architecture. And in one way, this is why Spotplug is open source. Open source makes sense when you have something, okay, that is either a commodity or something where an ecosystem needs to be built around. Yeah. And that's what we've been doing at the Eclipse Foundation. We are vendor neutral. We work with every member in the same way. And so it's a level playing field. And you, as a spa plug adopter, if you are a business person, essentially, you can trust us to manage this ecosystem in the name of the community, to be good stewards of the community uh, from a vendor neutral perspective. So... Once again, Spotplug is an enabler, and we at the Eclipse Foundation are the enablers of Spotplug in one way. <laughs> okay, so, um, I mean, in this day and age, really the, uh, the importance of uh, sustainability and green operations uh, cannot be overstated. So, can you speak to us about how MQTT and Spotplug can affect the um, uh, sustainability and uh, uh, environmental um, goals of the company? Absolutely. Um, one common misconception about digital technology is that it's green somehow. But even the cloud is not really green because all of those servers that are somewhere, right? The, the, the cloud is actually a set of data centers somewhere and they consume a lot and a lot of electricity. Right? And of course, depending on the source of this electricity, this means that your cloud is actually contributing to, to global warming and things like that. Um, now, of course, one potential thing you can do is to use rene renewable uh, energy sources. So that's great. But you can go further. And, and Spotlog helps from that perspective in two ways. The first way is really... The, the focus of Spotlog is really to reduce bandwidth consumption, right? The payloads are lightweight. The lack of polling response means that you will get updated data whenever you need them, but otherwise you are not sending useless messages all the time just to keep a connection alive or something like that. So all of that means that you consume much less bandwidth, which means that ultimately you consume much less power. And uh, on the top of it, Spotplug encodes everything in, in binary. So essentially, it's an efficient way to take even less space on the wire, so to speak. And so this translates once again to uh, energy savings. The second dimension is something that people don't really realize about open source. Uh, Spotlog is an open specification and it's got open source implementation uh, at the Eclipse Foundation, uh, which means that people that leverage Spotlog are not busy reinventing the wheel with their own solution to the problem. And by doing that, what they do is to contribute to sustainability and circular economy in the sense that by using and leveraging an existing technology, you build whatever you need to build to address a problem, but you use proven building blocks that have already been debugged, that have already been developed. And that, once again, is a more effective use of resources. You Focus your resource on the new stuff you need and you leverage the building blocks that are available in the ecosystem. And this makes the whole solution greener for sure. Now, one of the things that I would like to talk to you about before we um, close this session off is this uh, the issue of, of culture change, training and culture change within uh, industrial companies because Spark Black really is a, a new paradigm of 
communication, right? We're, we're used to a situation whereby uh, uh, software systems and components are really stacked up into like a silo uh, based on the ISA 95. Now, this distributed approach of, of, of putting together a system through a pub sub really is a new way of thinking. So what should organization do as far as training or culture change for them to be able to kind of like work with this? Yes. And there, I mean, the, the fundamental step is to break the reflex of request response. You know, PCUA and other request response protocols, you need to poll regularly the devices in order to know if they are online. And then uh, you need to poll them in many cases to get their data updates. If the, the central location in the system or the SCADA system, in the case of industrial automation, doesn't do that, then you will not get the updated values. So getting into MQTT and specifically into Sparklog means that you have published and subscribed. So it means that you have complete decoupling between the publishers and the subscribers. So a publisher will publish whenever it needs to publish and doesn't have to care if there are consumers or if there are subscribers to that information. So you publish and you are confident that any interested stakeholder will subscribe to that particular topic in order to get the data updates. And, and, and the best way to handle the transition is, is, I think, really to focus on the basics. If you are to do this transition, then get acquainted properly with MQTT, experiment with it, and see how different it is. And then you add, of course, Sparklog on the top. But Sparklog uses all of the standard MQTT behaviors and techniques, so you won't have to learn anything new in order to leverage it. In fact, uh, it's, it is a bit simpler in the sense that Sparklog defines things for you, so you don't have to make those decisions for yourself like you would do with plain MQTT. So the key here is education. You know, as a former teacher myself, maybe I'm, I'm a bit dated or a, a bit biased here, but really you need to take the time to see what MQTT can do for you and how different it is. But the good news is that there are people like you, you know, yeah. producing good content. And there's my book, if people care about the Eclipse uh, IoT ecosystem. And, and more generally speaking, IVMQ, you've been very good. You have a whole series of blogs about uh, MQTT fundamentals and things like that. And another whole series about Sparkplug. So there are things to do your self-education, I think. And, and plenty of videos, of course, on YouTube and all of that. So take the time to learn but expect that you need to break a few old behaviors. But the one thing to keep an eye for is polling response. If you find yourself saying, oh, but how do I you know, the, the, determine that a device is online? Or how do you do, I do, 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 um, I do, I do, I implement things in order to, to, to pull a device to get an immediate data update, then you are doing it wrong. You're just trying to replicate what you were already doing, and that's a recipe for disaster. So be aware of that, be mindful of that, educate yourself, and if you need help, you know, people like Uzai and myself are there to help. That's the power of an ecosystem. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Could you describe to us in detail how MQTT's Spark Block functions within an industrial IoT uh, network? Of course. So and, uh, we say MQTT Spark Plug because essentially Spark Plug uses MQTT as the transport protocol. So you need an MQTT broker somewhere at the minimum and, and maybe several depending, of course, of the kind of architecture that you have or maybe a cluster aware or highly available broker depending on the functional and non-functional needs that you have. Okay, so you've got your broker. What Sparkplug adds on the top of plain MQTT, so to speak, is essentially three things. One, a standard payload format. Two, a topic namespace, in other words, a structure for your MQTT topics, which is predictable and customizable up to a point. But we have pretty strong opinions about the structure. And third is what we call stateful session management. In other words, we use 
some of the features available in MQTT, like the last will and testament, to make sure that we know at any given time if a device is online or not. And the same for the SCADA system. So if the SCADA system goes down, then uh, we use the last will message on a specific topic that is defined just for that purpose that will be sent to every node. So maybe you buffer data locally while the SCADA system reboots and comes back or something like that. So uh, that's at a high level how it works. Now, if we dig a bit on each of those dimensions, so focusing on the payload format, uh, the way Sparkplug payloads are structured is not the same, let's say, as OPC UA information models. In OPC UA, they try to invent the perfect model for water pump or something like that, and then, okay, you, maybe you can add your own attributes, but yeah. So we don't care about that in Sparkplug. The payload is generic in the sense that it can represent any metric which is relevant to you, okay? So what we provide is a way to express those metrics, but it's up to you to define, okay, I want uh, water pressure in PSI, or I want, uh, you know, the, the number of letters in a specific reservoir or something like that, okay? Um, and that's really where Sparkplug shines in the sense that because the payload format is standard, then any Sparkplug enabled device or software component will be able to parse it and understand it. But at the same time, you know, whatever data you put in there is up to you and you get uh, flexibility because of that. So in order to simplify things, we provide developers uh, a schema for the payloads, and this schema is expressed in Google protocol buffers or protobuffs, okay? So there are many language implementations for that, so whatever type of environment you have, you can use protobuffs, and essentially when you have this schema which ships with the spec, you can generate skeletons for your code and, you know, it simplifies development. So that's how it works for the payload. The topic namespace then, okay, is structured in a specific way. We start with the version of the protocol and the payload encoding. Okay, so currently for Sparkplug version 3, okay, this is you know, slash SPB, SPB, so that's payload format B, V10. And, and so this can get confusing because it's version 3 of the protocol, but it's version 1 of that particular payload encoding, and that's what we care about. So uh, the next version of Sparkplug, Sparkplug version 4, will likely introduce payload format C. So you can run both Sparkplug 3 and Sparkplug 4 on the same broker because at the root, you have SPB, SPB or SPC eventually, you know, for version 4. So you won't mix up, you know, uh, messages from a different version. So that's the first step. After that, you add the notion of a group ID. Okay, and the group ID is something arbitrary that you decide. So if you want to segregate things by country or by locations for your various factories, whatever you want, you put it there. Then you have the ID of the edge node. Okay, and the edge node in Sparkplug is really a node that speaks Sparkplug natively. So in some cases, you will stop there. Okay, it's, it's really up to you. And in some other cases, you have non-Sparkplug devices connected to that edge node. Okay, maybe over Modbus or BatNet or whatever. And, and then what happens is that those devices can still be part of the namespace. So you will have a device ID after the node ID for those cases. Okay, mm -hmm. and the device ID matches whatever is connected to the node. So a Sparkplug native device will maybe not have you know, those devices attached, it would be considered an, an edge node, but whatever, you know, whatever floats your boat. So that's how things are structured. And then there is somewhere in the namespace, and <laughs> memory escapes me, I don't remember at what location it is, but you have the message type. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, so uh, I think the message type comes... Um, before uh, the, the, well, after the group ID, but before the edge node uh, ID. And uh, the message type, uh, there are various message types in Sparkplug. So 
the first one is the birth or death certificate. So you send that when you have a new device joining and you send the birth certificate saying, I'm device XYZ, I will report about those metrics. So every other node which is interested knows what this device will report about. And the death certificate, of course, is much simpler to say, I'm going out, so don't expect anything from me. Okay. Uh, then there are data messages for both edge nodes and devices. So those are the regular metric updates that you send when there's a change. Don't forget that spot plug is report by exception. So if a message, you know, a value is not changing, then you use retain messages, you know, on a specific topic according to whatever makes sense for your use case. And you don't send other messages until the value changes or maybe you want to refresh it for some reason, that's fine too. But ultimately, it's up to you to decide. And so uh, those data messages are much simpler than the birth certificate because you don't repeat some of the information about the metric, of course. You don't have to repeat the unit of measurement because, well, you declare it once and then nobody, it shouldn't change in the middle of an industrial process. Anyway, um, then... We have comment messages as well that can be sent to edge nodes or devices. And comments will be interpreted by the device. So this is about opening a door or uh, activating a pump or something like that. So it is, of course, uh, use case specific, but those messages are provided so that you can, well, actually do industrial automation yes. uh, in Sparkplug. And finally, uh, there's a last message type which is reserved for the SCADA system, so the specific topic uh, where the SCADA system will tell nodes, hey, I'm online, or hey, I'm going out. And once again, um, typically those messages will be sent as last will and testaments in the case of disconnections, so that if there's a technical issue with the infrastructure, then at least the other nodes know that something is happening in the environment. So that's how the topic structure or the topic namespace is, is built in Sparkplug. And then the stateful session management, well, we talked already uh, about it. So this is the notion that essentially I send my bird certificate and then I set my last will and testament as, as Sparkplug edge node so that relevant information is sent when there's an accidental disconnect. And that's how it works. And between the two, you don't need to pull the device. You know, because of the properties of MQTT, that the device is actually online. So you save on bandwidth because of that. So, uh, I mean, one of the uh, fundamental requirements in, in, in building an industrial IT solution is that it be scalable. Scalability is really a, a critical uh, factor as far as uh, industrial IT is concerned. So can you talk to us about how MQTT Sparkplug allows for building scalable industrial IoT systems? Of course. And there, uh, really, the key word, when, when we say scalability, what we really mean is, can this system absorb millions of messages ultimately? You know, when my business grows and, you know, I have so much business that, you know, I would need to, to run my factory 24-7, you know, at the at a huge scale in order to fulfill the demand. And, and so, uh, scalability, of course, is there tied closely to extensibility in the sense that I must be able to add capacity in a way that won't break the applications that use the infrastructure. And Sparkplug accommodates both. But the thing is, Sparkplug by itself is no more scalable, so to speak, than uh, what you will find in plain MQTT, except for one thing. Okay, so essentially the key to scale Sparkplug is, of course, to pick a highly available, highly scalable MQTT broker. Well, IVMQ is a good commercial example of that. And at the Eclipse Foundation, uh, we've got the Eclipse Amland project, which is uh, that kind of broker as well in open source. Um, but that in itself will get you a long way to have a, a high quality, uh, high performance broker. But then Sparkplug adds this notion that we try to optimize bandwidth consumption as much as possible, right? So the payloads are small. We try in messages not to repeat information that has already been shared, right? So that's why our bird certificate, you know, gives lots of context about the data. And then the data updates after that. 
they are smaller. Okay, so we save on bandwidth in multiple fashion uh, with Spark Plug, including the fact that by using Google protocol, bu uh, protocol buffers for the payload, essentially the payload is in binary, but then it's in a structured format when you serialize or deserialize. And so this is high performance. This is requires uh, this requires less resource to parse or to serialize, and um, at the same time it takes less space on the wire, so to speak. So it makes overall your network infrastructure more scalable because we use as little networking resources as possible in order to shuffle the data around. So from that perspective, Spaplug makes a difference from a scalability standpoint over plain MQTT because uh, it is really optimized in various ways to minimize network traffic. And you know, the combination, I think, of MQTT and Spotlight together really make a huge difference in terms of scalability, both for the infrastructure and the applications that connect to the infrastructure as well. Awesome. So how does uh, the Eclipse Foundation support the community of developers and companies who are working with Spotlight? So essentially, what we do is really this. We create an environment where the people that are the actual masterminds of Spotlog, so to speak, are able to work on an equal and level playing field. Okay. And, and really, this is about this notion. Well, first, maybe you're familiar with the Eclipse Foundation, maybe not. If you are familiar with us 20 years ago, maybe you associate us with the Eclipse development tool. Still around, still used by millions of developers, but if you don't like it, perfectly fine. We have plenty of other things, and Spotlog is one of the most exciting ones. Now, what we do at Eclipse is really this. We are a non-profit, okay? And we are a vendor-neutral non-profit, so any organization in the world can join the Eclipse Foundation, okay, if they desire to do so. And anyone on this planet can have an Eclipse open source project if they desire to do so, and membership is not even required in that case, okay? So really, we have our members that come and pay annual fees to us, and with those fees, we provide build servers for the project, and we have a number of staff members like myself, and what we do is to deliver services to our open source projects and to what we call our industry collaborations. So uh, there are various names there, you don't care about that, but essentially it's gathering of organizations that work on a common plan, on common objectives. So Spotlog, the Spotlog Working Group, is one of those uh, industry collaborations. And there, IVNQ, along with other members, they come together and set the strategy, the technology vision, and we execute on that. Uh, so what we do essentially is that we provide a development process to open source projects and our specification project, uh, spe oh, sorry, specification process for our specification projects. And those are the rules of engagement for everyone. So we are there as the vendor neutral, the, the referee in the middle, and we make sure that everyone plays by the rules and respects the three core values of openness, transparency, and uh, meritocracy. Okay, so yeah. those are the three core things that we do. Um, and, and that's really important because IVMQ has uh, some of its partners, but potentially some competitors that could come in the Spotlight Working Group, and that's fine. What we do is that we ensure that no one is taking Spotlight away from the community. So we hold the trademarks on Spotlog, for example. So no one can run with it and then say, oh no, <laughs> the Spotlog is just our own proprietary technology now. It won't happen because we hold those things on the behalf of the community. And the same, uh, we are the publishers uh, officially of the Spotlog specification. So anyone can redistribute it, but according to the Eclipse specification license, and this ensures that there are no weird uh, proprietary flavors of Spotlog that pop up here and there. You know, anyone can submit ideas and try to influence Spotlog, but ultimately it is a thing that we at the Eclipse Foundation administer and uh, 
to, you know, shepherd, so to speak, on the behalf of the community. And my role in this as the staff member uh, dedicated to IoT and Edge is really to sit down with HiveMQ and the other members that we have to understand, okay, what are the, the ideas? What are the needs? What needs to happen in this ecosystem for it to grow? And then together, we establish a program plan, we execute on that, integrating the ideas of everyone. And I make sure that we do that publicly, transparently, and according to the principles of meritocracy. So, you know, if you are so interested in Spaflog that you start, let's say, um, proposing uh, uh, ideas or even uh, making pull requests on the spec or on the open source implementation in Eclipse Taboo, then after some time, you become eligible to be a committer, right? And this means you will be treated in exactly the same way as the current committers and that your organization will derive the same benefits from your membership and your participation in Spotlog as every other one. But, you know, I'm, I'm saying this and we have safeguards against, uh, let's say, uh, underhanded business and things like that. But in my nearly five years of experience, all I've seen around the table is a willingness to contribute, you know, an openness to others. And of course, then competition happens, right? And that's okay. We're perfectly fine with that. But ultimately, what will define the success of our members in the commercial space is up to them. What we provide is this environment where everyone can work on common goods, on things that are shared. And for the rest, then we, of course, are happy, uh, uh, you know, of the commercial successes of our members. But in one way, we don't care in the sense it's up to them. And that's the perfect mix, right? We provide the governance layer at the bottom where everyone is treated in the same way. And then we have the collaboration layer, which is the Spotlog open specification process uh, and the Spotlog open uh, specification project. And uh, in parallel, the Eclipse Tagu implementation. So people collaborate there. And whatever happens in the competition layer is up to the members. So that's a perfect fit, I think, in terms of adaptation to the market so that our members can dream about incredible commercial products with proper support in the commercial space. And if you want to do open source, there are ways to run Sparklog with a pure open source stack, uh, no strings attached as well. So. It's up to you, ultimately, to determine as a spot plug adapter what's the best product strategy, so to speak, for your organization. But in any case, whatever you do, you're welcome in the spot plug community. So, uh, I mean, in closing, I would like to get your take on what you see, how you see the role of MQTT spot plug evolving within the next few years. Of course, of course. And uh, this brings us to the topic of uh, Spotlog version 4. So in Spotlog version 3, uh, and that's already version 3, so people will say, well, well, we said that it's an emerging technology or something like that. Uh, the thing is, Spotlog goes back to 2016, right? And it evolved over time. But really, with version 2.2, the last version before it was given to Eclipse, you know, the fundamentals of Spotlog were uh, fairly, fairly uh, well defined at that point. So Spotlog version 3 was the first version under the Eclipse process. And at the Eclipse Foundation, we have a stringent process for specifications. We don't do just documents there. We have, of course, a specification document, but we also require our spec projects to publish an API when it makes sense. Spotlog doesn't have an API because it uses MQTT. That's the API, so we don't need to redefine that. And we require every specification at Eclipse to have a compatibility kit. So a piece of code, which is open source, that you can use to validate that any implementation is fully compliant with the spec. Okay, So the, all of those things are worked together. And Spotlog version 3 was an effort to clean up the document, to bring it to the level of a proper Properly written spec, you know, prior, prior versions had little grammar things and little structural problems. So we fixed and cleaned up everything from a document perspective. But we also took the time 
And when I say we, it's not me, it's really our open source contributors in the, in the community, including, of course, IBMQ employees. And they all came together to write the compatibility kit and uh, on the top of it to adapt the Eclipse Tahoo open source implementation to the last version of the spec. And that took more time than expected because writing a comprehensive test suite to exercise something with so many features as spot plug, I mean, that takes time. I think in the spec, there are close to 120 or maybe a bit less normative statements. So things that implementations need to do, and we need to write at least one test for each of them. <laughs> so that's a lot of work. Um, so that was the focus, right? Clean up, a compatibility kit, and, and publish everything for the first time under the Eclipse process. Uh, and, and version 3 was ratified uh, or officially adopted in November of 2022. And at that point, we decided that the time was right. So we went to ISO IEC and proposed SPAPLOG as an international standard. And I have the pleasure, uh, the process is still on the way, so this will take some time, but there was a ballot of ISO IEC, uh, and essentially the national bodies that represent standard organizations in countries all over the world approved SPAPLOG as an international standard. That was in May, yes. Uh, and congratulations to the community. It's their first that brought us there. So Sparklog will be known as, also as ISO IEC 20,237. <laughs> Rolls off the tongue. Uh, but really, this is an official recognition of its impact and quality by the international standardization community. So that's a fantastic step forward. So by the end of 2023, it should, everything should be complete, I hope, and it will be officially published. But you know, it's it's a done deal at this point. It's just, well, there are some administrative steps that we need to take care of. And then this brings us to Spotlog 4. So now that tree is um, done uh, and, and uh, dusted, uh, in the case of Spotlog version 4, we now can think about adding new features uh, and functionality to uh, the specification. Now there are many of those things uh, and, and the specification committee that manages the evolution of Sparklog just adopted, you know, the scope for the version 4 release. So um, we will communicate, you know, uh, in, in the fall because right now we are, well, we are literally in summer. So, you know, nobody cares. <laughs> or at least we care about our families and our vacation time as it should be. So uh, at fall, we will start communicating more about the scope of the release, but what you will see there is really a, a renewed focus on uh, lightweight messages and uh, quality of life improvements that would make it easier even for developers to leverage it and, and things like that. Um, Sparklog is intentionally very simple. Currently, version 3 is about 130 pages. So yeah. the plan is not to complexify things and, and get it into thousands of yes. pages. Uh, certainly not with version 4. Uh, simplicity is still a design goal. Uh, so stay tuned for a more detailed explanation of what the team has in mind for version 4. But in any case, you know, I said that we had the, the scope for version 4. This is true but there's always a place for new ideas and improvements at any given time. And maybe they will get added to version 4, maybe they will get delayed because, of course, uh, our open source contributors have uh, day jobs and, and other things that they need to do for their employers, and that's fine. Uh, but ultimately, you can, as a spot plug adopter, go forward, go on GitHub, have a conversation with the team and propose new ideas, which is something that you wouldn't see with competing standards that are developed uh, behind closed doors. So my expectation for the next five years is that we will see an acceleration of innovation in spot plugging, and certainly that we will see major players in the market adopt it. Right now, we have already plenty of devices in the field in real-world applications. Um, to give you an example, I won't name the company because we are this close to have them as a new member, but uh, a big uh, maker of uh, 
cooling and other uh, HVAC equipment in the US. Uh, they have uh, literally millions of air conditioning units uh, that have been uh, sold to homes and each and every one is spot plug enabled. Oh, wow. Okay, which enables remote monitoring and all sorts of value added features for whoever is managing that infrastructure on the behalf of the customers. So that's just one example of the kind of impact that SparkPlug already has. So my expectation five years from now, we will talk about industry giants to which you know, we are already speaking and you know, we will get them to adopt SparkPlug because it makes simply so much sense. It's simple, it's lightweight, it solves actual problems. So, you know, we won't displace with it everything that's in the field, everything that is already deployed, that's not the plan. But we can integrate with that and then innovate for new projects and uh, value-added features in the future with SparkLog. So five years from now, if we, we you know, I come back yes. to uh, Lance, uh, Lance, uh, Lance Sartre, uh, yeah. and uh, we have that conversation again, uh, I'm expecting that we'll have, you know, lots of major equipment makers in various verticals and even maybe connected cars and things like that, that will have SparkLog built in. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly, love to have you back here at Dansuit. So, yeah, it's always a pleasure talking to you, Frederick. Thank you so much for coming through and thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Of course, thank you so much for having me and uh, I'm already looking forward to my next visit. Absolutely. Yeah, so that brings us to the end of this session. Thank you so much for watching and goodbye.